Welcome back to Pace Immigration, paceimmigration.com on the YouTube channel and on the podcast talking again with immigration lawyer Michael O'Rourke. Michael, freshly back from New York City. Hey, Sean. How's it going? It's going very well. You were down at the uh, American Immigration Lawyers Association annual conference. I wanted to do a quick recap of that to catch up. I thought it'd be cool to get it out there that uh, you attend these things and that you see a lot of stuff down there. You learn a lot and then you come back and you can use it for your clients. Uh, let's get off uh, on the right foot by talking about what's really important. How were the lunches and dinners at the AILA conference? Okay. So if you <laughs> got the lunches at the Javits Center, they sucked. They were really, really bad. <laughs> but yeah, well, you know, any convention center anywhere around the world, it's you're going to have the catering uh, companies come in and you get the the dry turkey sandwich. And yeah, so you don't do that. But okay. luckily, the city has uh, now built up so much and the Hudson Yards complex is open and there's all sorts of good things there. And um, in between these crazy sessions, we had 30 minutes to to run out and grab food and they had some food trucks downstairs which were okay but way overpriced uh right. and then there's the rest of new york city around so um i found this great italian deli and i had the best eggplant parmigiana with chicken big hoagie sandwich it was it was amazing i, I went there a couple times uh yeah, yeah. and then uh, uh all of the different groups um both the canada chapter for uh ayla and the rome district chapter which covers europe and africa um they had their own lunches and dinners uh and those were always really good so i i managed to remain well fed Right. You, you're a big fan of New York City, as am I, but you actually spent way more time than I did uh, in New York because uh, you used to live there. Talk about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I went to Brooklyn Law uh, and uh, I lived in Brooklyn while I was going to law school there. And uh, then when I was in my uh, at the second summer, so between year two and year three of law school, I actually got a job working on Wall Street for a reinsurance firm. And it was really interesting. And I managed uh, to do my last year of law school over three semesters because I went and worked with them full time. But I was actually making money as a law student and just uh, kind of living that Manhattan life, even though I was living it in Brooklyn. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And then a, a few years after I had moved out west, uh, I came back uh, because my partner was doing a PhD program. Uh, so I, I worked at a big, uh, very well-known firm there doing litigation and living the Manhattan life now in my 30s uh, and still a lot of fun. Every time I go back to New York, a little bit older and a little bit more tired, though, it seems like I'm too <laughs> old and too tired <laughs> for it anymore. Right, right. The uh, the studio 54 days, I guess, are a little bit behind you or what? Yeah, yeah. Now I'm like, <laughs> uh, well, I was going to try and right. make some sort of joke with Geritol, but it just wasn't coming to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is a fantastic city. It's a great place to have a conference because, of course, after after hours, you can get out there. But let's talk a little bit about what happened inside the walls, hopefully without making people's eyes glaze over too much. Uh, you attended a ton of different panels. You saw a lot of different people. We had some pictures online on the LinkedIn feed and on the Pace Immigration feed for people to come and say hello. So hopefully you made some connections. Uh, but what what's the story about you? You gave me a couple of examples of things that you wanted to talk about. Uh, number one, pertaining to fees. Yeah. So one of the things that has been rumored and um, and uh, USCIS has been asking for it now looks like it's actually happening. So there is going to be a fee increase for all U.S. immigration petitions and applications. Not quite sure about the timing of it, but it is coming. Um, the second uh, thing to know in regards to fees is that USCIS is starting to expand the um, uh, premium processing program. So for just a mere $2,500, you could have a USCIS adjudicator look at your petition and hopefully return an answer within 15 days. Although 
that hopefully is, has a big asterisk right next to it because often it can be a we need more evidence uh, okay to well back. but that still is good to, I, I think the premium processing thing is a, is a good thing to have yeah a lot of my clients do use it because otherwise your petitions can sit there for six months and not happen right. and and it's impossible to plan when you've got something that's taking so very long sure uh, one other thing you mentioned was the so the e visas. First of all, uh, describe what the e visa is, and then talk about the developments there. Yeah, so there are two e visas that are yeah, unless you're Australian, then there's a third one. But there are two main e visas that a number of nationalities can take advantage of. They're treaty based, so a treaty investor is an e two, and a treaty trader is an e one. Uh, they both. Uh, have to do with substantial business, either as an investment in the United States or as trade between your home country and the United States. Um, uh, they're a State Department uh, jurisdictional visa. So uh, you don't make an application to USCIS for the original e-visa, but you go to your local consulate and they interpret the treaty. They make sure that you have either invested enough, that you have a bona fide business, that it's something that's not marginal, which means that it's paying for more than just your salary and that you're ultimately planning to hire Americans and, and develop a thriving business. So um, uh, the consulate's uh, generally go through and they review the applications. They ultimately schedule you for an interview and then you have an e-visa to be able to work and live in the U.S. for five years at a time. It's taking a long time now uh, to get e-visas at any consulate in the world. Canada, we're seeing usually a six-month turnaround time between, between the time we submit and the time that we actually get our clients in for interviews but some of the um, consulates have just stopped adjudicating them entirely um, for instance bogota colombia is no no now no longer doing it as is amon jordan they've just stopped so uh, so what's the upshot here i mean if we're talking that they've just completely stopped are are people in that region just completely out of luck yeah they're kind of sol uh really wow, uh, wow. Uh, yeah, um, uh, because getting a third country national appointment, uh, that means an appointment at a consulate where you don't have citizenship or reside in the consulate district, difficult, very difficult. Uh, and with COVID and all of the shutdowns and just the massive backlogs, uh, we've only heard of one consulate, the US consulate in London, uh, the UK, is the only one that will entertain a third country national so it's it's near impossible for people in these geographies to make their business plans happen so what's the deal here i mean is this just a, some kind of a budget cutback what's going on it's i don't think it's budgetary i think it's more um during the pandemic uh, the state department lost some officers others were rotated out uh it takes quite a bit of training especially to be able to do the e-visa adjudication because they're very complex and um you need to have a good foundation both in the law and in business to understand what you're seeing so i think it state department is just trying to ramp up uh they have have said that they are hiring 500 more officers, uh, although a majority of those officers are going to India. I'm not sure where the other officers are going to be deployed. And but, there's no guarantee that that's even focusing on E2, is it? I mean, if, five, if the majority of 500 are going to India, are we talking about, like, they're not going there specifically to handle E-Visa cases, are they? No, they're not. Right. Um, and I, I think it's short-sighted on, term, uh, on uh, behalf of the State Department to do this because e-visas represent either increased trade with the U.S. or increased investment in the U.S. And we're almost saying that the U.S. is not open for business if we can't get these people and their entrepreneurial spirit and their money to come into the U.S. I was going to say this is actually quite surprising talking to you about this because we often use the E visa. We, you know, we say the words E2 or E1 all the time when it comes to people saying, hey, 
I want to open a business in the United States or I want to do trade or I have enough trade going with the United States that I want to move there. This really hamstring hamstrings a lot of people. Yeah, it really does. And that's a real shame. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, the EB5, I'm not sure this is any earth shattering news, but you did mention EB5 when we were off air. Maybe cover a bit of what's going on with the EB5 because it's always a hot button. Yeah. So as you know, uh, EB5 is now back and up and running both for direct investment and for regional centers. But there have been EB5 petitions that are sitting out there for three or four years that USCIS hasn't adjudicated. Um, one of the sessions that I went to had some really renowned litigators uh, talking about cases that they have filed in federal court on an old constitutional writ called a writ of mandamus. Okay, so this I'm going to get geeky for a moment. This uh, sounds like uh, Lord of the Rings or something here. I don't know. The mandamus. Okay. We're bringing out mandamus. <laughs> uh, but um, writ of mandamus is one of the original constitutional writs where you can force a government uh, official to come to court and to explain himself or herself. So um, writ of mandamus is a way to bring USCIS in court and to have the judge rule to either, uh, well, basically for USCIS to say why there's been a delay and to force them to make a decision one way or another on your case. Um, so it, there are some complexities with mandamus, but um, a number of my colleagues have been successful in getting USCIS to look at these cases again and provide a final answer. What And how does this apply to the EB-5? I, I apologize for my confusion because there's kind of two paths to the EB-5, is there not? There's the uh, um, the one path where you're investing in a business and then there's another path. Which, which one does this apply to? Uh, it applies to all of them actually. So um, no matter which way you're coming to the EB-5 program, in the statute, it says that you are entitled to an answer within 90 days of your application. The only way USCIS can kick that 90 days down the road is by asking to interview the applicant, and then they only get another 90 days from that point um, to make their final decision. So 180 days. But we're seeing three, four years for our EB five clients. So, I was going to say a hundred, like 180 days, nonsense, right? Like it. it well, it even that's happen. too much. Right. Yeah, <laughs> but sure. Yeah. Three and four years—that's crazy. Yeah, that's incredible. So much changes in three or four years. Who would even bother up, applying after a while if they hear that that's the actual number? That's nuts. Right. If you're going to make an investment of. $500,000 million or under the new program, 800000 or $1.9 million and then just sit for three, four years while USCIS tries to make up its mind, that's insane. Not going to happen. It seems like all we're talking about now these days with immigration is backlogs both uh, north of the border and south of the border. Yeah, and globally too. Um, right. uh, one interesting part of this conference, uh, there's a group called Global Migration Section, which I'm also a part of, and it's all of the international lawyers who practice um, their own home jurisdiction law, and some of them also practice U.S. law at the same time. And uh, we're hearing about backlogs everywhere, and just it's lack of personnel, lack of political will to get things done. And uh, just yeah, I mean, it's slowing. Yeah, I mean, I see the pictures of people in Canada, you know, on lawn chairs at, at 12 a.m., 12.01 a.m., because they're hoping to get into that office at 9 a.m. to even hope to talk to someone about a passport. It's uh, frankly ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it, it's such a long wait for, for hundreds of people. And then even when they get in, they get told to come back. I've got the, a personal experience with that with someone who finally did get in and then they got to the front of the line and then the office closed for the day. So they had to do it over again. It's, uh, it's yeah, incredible. big yeah, sigh. So. Um, so let's end on a happy note. Uh, okay. Free plug, if you remember the name of that uh, of that restaurant that had the incredible eggplant parm. Do you remember the name of the restaurant? By any chance? Um, it is <laughs> Sal Salgimos Salamaria. Okay, okay. It's, it's on Ninth Avenue between Thirty Fifth and Thirty Sixth. It's on the um, east side of Ninth just above 35th 
It is definitely an S word for the first name, but <laughs> Salivary is the second name. You can Google it. All right. And so yeah. I, I should get at least half the prize for that. Sure. And, you know, it's just such a great city. You, you mentioned Ninth Avenue. I remember the first time I was there and I like to do this. I'll just pick an avenue. I'll, I'll walk all of Ninth all the way down to the water and then I'll turn around and come up Eighth. And there's just yeah. so much to see and do in New York City. It's just a lovely place. Uh, Michael, thanks for joining us. Thanks for the recap on what's going on with the American Immigration Lawyers Association and uh, U.S. immigration in general. And we'll touch base with you again soon. That sounds great, Sean. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.